What's up book to you? It's Leah Cooper and today I am going to talk to you about everything I read in May. So May is not quite over. We've got today and tomorrow left and I am furiously attempting to try to get a book finished in that time but it realistically it's not going to happen. I'm really close but I'm not going to finish. So I am going to go ahead and just film this video today and I'll talk to you about the things that I have written I have finished reading as of right now. May was a pretty solid month considering how little reading I did. I kind of had a slump in the middle slash end of the month where I just wasn't picking up anything but I did read a total of 1,317 pages making this my third lowest month which really doesn't that's irrelevant like I'm, pretty much my goal while I'm in school is to just read over a thousand pages and I did that so woohoo go me. I read a total of eight things. Uh, I read two things for class, one audiobook, one book for my own reading, and then five short stories. And I think that was everything. So let's talk about the things that I read for class first instead of going in order. For class, I read Undrowned by Alexis Pauline Gums. I categorize this as nonfiction. Specifically, I would call it a essay collection. I'm actually going to pull it up on Goodreads because it has a really long subtitle, which tells you exactly what it's about. Okay, the full title is Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. And this is part of the Emergent Strategy Collection from, who is the press? Not the dumb gurries. Why don't you tell me who the publisher is? Anyway, so I categorized this as a collection of essays. They were originally published on Gums's Instagram, I believe, uh, kind of like as daily meditations. That's the other thing. This is kind of a clash between essay, uh, science writing and meditation or even somatics you might say. From Goodreads it says Undrowned is a book, flink, book Undrowned is a book length meditation for social movements and our whole species based on the subversive and transformative guidance of marine animals. Our aquatic cousins are queer, fierce, protective of each other, complex, shaped by conflict, and struggling to survive the ex extractive and militarized conditions our species has imposed on the ocean. Gums employs a brilliant mix of poetic sensibility and naturalist observations to so show what they might teach us, producing not a specific agenda, but an unfolding space for wandering and questioning. And so basically, she's writing about various marine mammals and kind of the interconnectedness, not just of like the impact humans have had on them, but what we could learn from them. Um, and this is like, you know, everything from seals to dolphins to whales. There's also a fair bit of kind of historical nonfiction science writing where she is conveying information about these species. But her, her aim, and she talks about this in her foreword, is to make this a very like personal type of science writing. She talks about how in science writing, you know, she read these these books about these animals written predominantly by like, you know, white male scientists, cishet, etc. Uh, and, and they remove themselves from their writing. Like they have this, like, we hold unbiased clinical science on like a pedestal. And she, one of her aims was to kind of reintroduce the personal into scientific writing to talk about how she loves these animals, etc and to challenge scientists to write more personally about their own connectedness with this, the, the animals that they're talking about. And she's also talking in many ways about the personhood of marine mammals. So it's a really interesting collection. I think as a whole, it can be a little repetitive. Uh, like she just, she uses sometimes similar language, similar phrasing, where if you were just reading this like on a daily or weekly post on Instagram, you might not notice some of the repetitiveness, but since it's in a book where you're reading through it, it, it becomes a little bit more apparent. 
but I think the content of what she's writing about and like her her aims and goals is very very interesting so if you're at all interested in like ecology environmentalism environmental climate a, a huge thing I took away from it is you know when we when we when you think of the 80s or the 90s and climate activism at least in my head the except the expression save the whales comes to mind and I, it also comes to mind as being like especially in like cinema a derisive shorthand for oh those crazy environmentalists um but i think gums reminds you or at least she reminded me that we still need to save the whales like like they haven't been saved. I never hear anyone use that kind of like that slogan anymore. You know, we're because there's so many other issues, right? And and we're so focused, I think, on heat and temperature, right? Rightly so, because fundamentally that is the driving force of like all climate change. But I feel like it's divorced us from thinking about the actual species that are being impacted. And the fact that just because we stopped saying save the whales, in my head, I've always kind of thought, well, maybe maybe we did save them. Maybe we did enact the kind of legislation we needed to protect them. But no, we didn't. <laughs> um, or, or we did and, and no one enforces it and people ignore it and they still kill the whales. I mean, there's, there's some really horrifying pieces of information in this book about um, how, how uh, big giant motorized boats just will not turn out of the way of whales like the whales generally cannot hear boats because of baffle and the frequency at which propeller noises carry they just it's like a blind spot and so they can't tell that a boat is there and so they can't get out of the way but a literal mechanized boat just won't turn for them like so many whales die from fucking boat strikes like whales that are older than you and me like 7,500 years old, they've survived a lot of shit, and then they get taken out because a commercial boat won't turn. It's it's awful. Anyways, and there's like, there's a lot of stuff in here. It also talks about dolphin captivity, and and it's very, it's a very interesting book. Like, I'm talking about it, and I'm like, I only gave it like a three star, three and a half star in Goodreads, because I, I do think there was some like repetitiveness to it. Not all of the sections really struck me or stuck with me, but some of them were really, really interesting. And it's not a very long book. It's only like 120 pages. So I do think that if you're interested in these topics, it's really worth picking up. It's a very interesting project. So that was the first thing I read for class. The second thing I read for class was another kind of ecology, uh, personhood of animals book. And that was Talia Field's new release, Personhood. This is a poetry collection. And interestingly enough, um, I, we did have, Talia Fields is a like personal friend of my professor this quarter. So she came and spoke to my class the week we read this. And we had a big long Q&A fundamentally this is not my thing the just the style is just not my thing i don't know exactly what movement fields field falls under uh but it's just not my thing <laughs> uh i think there was one section happy that you have the body the mirror uh the mirror test which is about the elephant happy who is currently um being held captive in the Bronx Zoo and is part of a legal battle to have her not autonomy recognized but to have her habeas corpus recognized and to have her removed have it be like acknowledged that she's being held against her will basically in solitary confinement in captivity and that she has the right to not be in that situation um and that section is very interesting and the court case surrounding happy is very interesting and this also talks about the mirror test which is something scientists use to kind of try to gauge the levels of sentience in creatures anyway that was very interesting there was also uh, the first section was about a uh, parrot bird sanctuary which is also very sad Oh, there's also a really interesting section called Turns Before the Curtain, which is about um, invasive species. And 
there is another section liberty trees which is also about invasive species and the death of certain nut trees in the united states and then another section i really liked is the health of my stream or the most pathetic fallacy which ironically when we were having our little q a field talks about how she specifically wrote it in a style that she finds sickening but is the most like easily accessible and that's talking about the personhood of streams and also it's connected to um, a stream in india which has been granted basically personhood rights um and has now like a instead of having a, like a department of ecology running it has like a an advocate general but apparently that that whole story is supposed to be kind of like a tongue-in-cheek snide kind of story so the fact that I found it the most understandable, I felt a little insulted because apparently that just means I'm stupid. Anyway, fundamentally, this is not my thing. I think I gave it like two stars because I, I really only liked the hap the happy chapter I thought was really good. Um, I will, however, I will say I did, I did outline this one section from I think Happy's chapter and it says a few months ago, an elephant in a South African game park killed a poacher hunting for black rhinos. The elephant took the poacher's body to a place where it could be eaten by lions. So there are some like nuggets of really interesting stuff. Like, so instance, I think this is really interesting and relevant. In Hegel's ritual, death is only perceived as real by the one who will become enslaved. The master is a master because he doesn't understand his dependence on life and therefore doesn't fear or take into account the reality of death. I think we could, we could apply that to, um, business owners who don't want to pay a living wage <laughs> and uh, them being mad that people aren't willing to accept shit for their labor anyway but there's other sections there's other sections like this Uthbird utterly lost tongue dangerous some of a shadow of a baby exposed starved between roots and trees in a coffin hole a few hours old and nobody's claim deformed or not drooling oiling leaves glimmer plastic eternal fungus and mold here here utterly broken grammar placenta dried in dirt devoid the spore of ghost jumps your back the forest weighing you down on night roads seed your hollow head sink your spine there there with every shrieking sound on earth every murmur consoling i have no throat i don't i don't know how to i don't know what to take from that i don't know how to read that i don't know how to interpret it i have already been talking about these books these two books though for way too long so i'm gonna end it there uh if you're a fan of field she has a new book out that's basically what i can say about that now on to the books that i read for myself this month um the first thing i finished on the second was a carryover from last month and that was spindles end by robin mckinley i started reading this for the women write classic sff readathon <laughs> and uh this was my pick for the third decade it was published in 2000 this is my first robin mckinley i loved this book i think i gave it five stars i absolutely adored it i'm also glad that this was my first mckinley because i it, it like it was such a good read this really puts me it, it inspires me to it really puts me in the mood to try more of her work so this is a sleeping beauty retelling and oh i loved the way she subverted the tropes in this book it's so good so basically we've got the traditional sleeping beauty legend our protagonist one of our protagonists is a young fairy who's picked from her village to go attend the name day ceremony on the name day ceremony she's given it a magical amulet by another fairy and it, it helps her break through the barrier protecting the princess after maleficent casts her curse she grabs the princess in the hubbub and um gives her her gift of being able to talk to animals and then an, another fairy who loves the princess tells her okay you need to run before anyone sees you you take care of her hide her and i'll contact you when i have a plan <laughs> um so catriona the fairy runs off with the little princess takes her back home raises her as her cousin 
as a completely normal person and uh eventually it kind of switches into more of briar rose's pov um eventually they are discovered a couple of months before her name day by um the fairy godfather who originally gave catriona the protective amulet and then they hatch a plan to disguise her friend as her leading up to her name day and a lot of stuff happens and i don't want to i don't want to spoil the end the end is so good there is a very very small thread of like a slow burn romance in the second half of this which i i loved so much i had so many feelings um this is great if you like fairy tale retellings this is amazing it definitely has a little bit more it it, it definitely has that kind of slow meandering and also kind of slightly removed fairy tale tone but I also really love that. So yeah, I really, really liked this. This was fantastic. Thank you everyone who's been telling me I need to read Robin McKinley. You were all 100% right. I freaking loved it. I do have a couple of other Robin McKinley books. I don't know when I'll get to them, but I have them. I'm glad I picked them up now because I will get to them eventually. The other book I read this month for my personal reading was my audiobook and that was The High King's Tomb by Kristen Britton. This is the third book in the Green Rider series. I'm listening to all of these on audiobook. They're, they're just my current audio obsession. I really love them and they also fit with my attempts to read longer books this year because they're all like over 600 pages. Love it. So this continues almost immediately on from the end of First Rider's Call. Obviously now in the third book there's not much I can talk about because it, it's too spoilery. I will say this has been the weakest book in the series in my opinion. Uh, Kerrigan was kind of a bitch. She was kind of a judgmental bitch. Uh, there is way too much especially in the beginning of tight lacing and inaccurate stereotypical bad corsetry representation. <laughs> like just because you're wearing a corset doesn't mean you suddenly can't breathe you know I really kind of th those early sections of the book really bugged me because they were clearly just like someone who's not like a historical costumer at all having just like corsets are anti-feminist that kind of attitude and it's just so like it's dated in a bad way so I didn't love that then of course uh Kerrigan it goes on a long uh, message journey basically and she stays with at a brothel for a while and is extremely judgmental to all of the women living there even though this is one of those brothels where it's owned by a madam who actually like is providing a safe place for women who don't have a whole lot of other recourses like it's it's so it's like framed as good but like Kerrigan never like comes around to like being having like a a growing moment about her it's it's awful and oh god I hated that section and she's also extremely judgmental because she finds out her father who's not married anymore because her mother's been dead for like 15 years ha like is friends with the owner of the brothel and like uses the brothel sometimes and she's incredibly awful about that um and it, anyway and then there's this whole plot line with another new young writer who she's sort of mentoring on this this message uh that he is like really negligent to animals because his father was a butcher i mean he was he, i can't remember the term he, he killed horses though he butchered horses who were sold to him and i i didn't think that the resolution of what happens with his character it was too abrupt because of how long he was just a terrible irritating character through this book so like those sections with them were just such a drag to read i also don't know where the hell the romance is going with this series and it kind of was putting me on edge that being said i really loved about the last 30 to 40 percent of this book it got really interesting when we actually kind of like dug into all of like the ongoing plot threads that finally you know picked up at the end of the book and came together and big exciting things happened that was really good and it went in interesting places I have the next book on hold 
I'm kicking myself for not requesting it earlier. I just assumed it wouldn't be available and it's not and I have to wait and ah, it's terrible. Anyways, I will be continuing and I'm hoping that Kerrigan's less of a bitch in the next book. That's, I'll just, I'll just say that. And then after that, the only other things I read were short stories. So I won't lie, this put me in a reading slump. Like as I was reading it, I was in a reading slump because like this isn't a long book. And so I and I and I was pacing myself reading this because I didn't want to just read it through in one sitting because it's poetry. But I could not compel myself to read anything else while I was reading this because I just didn't want to pick up anything. I didn't want to read anything. And I kind of felt the same way in Undrowned. Undrowned kind of put me in a reading slump too, even though I thought, thought that was more interesting. And yeah, I just struggled to pick up another book. I didn't I just didn't want to read another book. So what I did instead is I, I just read some short stories because they were easy. You know, I didn't have to commit to a long period of time reading them. I could just read them in like one one sitting and it was great. And I did read a couple of really good ones. So all of these short stories are available to read for free online. Um, most of them I was reading for the Nebula shortlist for short stories. Uh, I think one, one of them was not. One of them was a new release. I will have links to all of these stories down below though if any of them sound interesting. So the first one I read was Advanced Word Problems in Portal Math by Amy Picho, Pico, and this is a very very short, only about four pages, short story, and it is, it's literally word problems about, it, it presents a situation around a protagonist and then gives you a math problem about the, having you calculate or challenging you to calculate her chances of finding a portal into another world. And it's a commentary on basically feminism or, 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 and, and patriarchy. And it's great. Go read it. It's only four pages. Go read it. It's really good. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's very clever. Like the format is, is very clever. The next thing I read was a guide for working breeds by Vina G. Min Prasad. And this is a little bit longer. Editing Leah here, just going to pop in real fast to say a couple extra things about this short story. So A Guide for Working Breeds was part of a multi-author multi anthology called Made to Order, which was published by Rebellion, I believe, and it's edited, edited by Jonathan Strahan. And I didn't pick up this short story collection because like robots aren't a selling point to me. I know they are for a lot of people. So like this might be a multi-author anthology collection that you're very interested in picking up. I, I say I mentioned this because like I for the last couple of years have been reading almost every single short multi-author short story anthology that Jonathan Strahan has edited and put together because they're so good. Um, I've read about four at this point um, and I have I own a few more that I haven't gotten to yet and I'm always like on the lookout for them. I will say I do remember when this collection came out I didn't realize he edited it and I just saw, noticed the robot thing and so I never I didn't look into it more. I kind of regret not doing that just because from my experience Strahan puts together amazing authors into his collection like the the stories he picks the stories he solicits and the authors he gets to write uh for his collections are just they're so good and they're so well put together his anthologies in my experience too tend to have more hits than misses like obviously with multi-author anthologies a lot of times maybe you'll like half the stories and you don't drive with the other half in his I would say usually at least 90% of the stories are hits for me personally now obviously that's just personal taste but I, I mean it's something to consider the short story I'm talking about here a guide for where he breeds was specifically and individually republished by Tor so I will leave a link to where you can read it online below on Tor.com but uh I don't know maybe check out the anthology like if if you really like robots too because the editor in my experience is a pretty good bet. <laughs> this is a finalist for the short story category of the Nebulas, and I think it might also be a finalist in the Hugos. And basically, this is about a uh, new artificial intelligence who's been assigned a mentor artificial intelligence. And it's basically text 
conversations between them back and forth and of like one of them asking you know questions to the other um the one who's new is kind of working shitty food industry jobs uh the mentor is like an assassin ai robot uh the the new robot it really loves good dogs and funny dog videos and makes a playlist of funny good doggos for <laughs> its mentor and it, it's a great story. I'm not doing it justice, but basically if you want to read about robots who appreciate a good doggo, one of them being an assassin robot, uh, go read it. It's so, it's so charming. It's so charming. Anyways, go read it. Seriously, just go. Okay. And then the third short story I read was The Golden Carrot by K.S. Shear. This is a new release. I can't remember where it was it was either from strange horizons or uncanny i don't remember now but again i'll link down below this is a short story about a fantasy kingdom and the unlucky farmers who pull out jewels instead of carrots that's what i'll say i parts of this were really clever it wasn't quite as good as i was hoping there was like a, a pull quote on twitter um, for this book that was so good it instantly grabbed my attention I clicked and read I will say the whole story was a little bit disappointing but it's a really clever idea if it sounds cool go check it out it's not super long and then the last thing I read was also um, a shortlisted short story in definitely the Hugos I want to say it's also shortlisted for the nebula and that is the eight thousanders by Jason Stanford so this is about tech bros climbing Mount Everest and there's a vampire and I really liked it until the end. I hated the ending. The ending kind of ruined it for me. In fact, like it was probably, okay, did I rate this? Yes. I gave this a three star. It was a solidly four star until the ending, but it just kind of went into that really cliche bro -y, obsession with the female vampire at the end that I didn't love but up until that part it was saying some interesting stuff about tech bros and and also I mean I, I recently saw an article about people talking about Mount Everest and how Jesus colonizers can we like get the fuck off Everest because we've turned it into a trash pit and we're taking advantage of the native Nepalese people and it is pretty terrible so um you can go check this out because like 75 percent of it was really good <laughs> that's like that's not a glowing recommendation I, I will say go check out the first two i mentioned advanced portal maths and um, a guide for working breeds those two without hesitation really really good and i would highly recommend them anyways i think i've talked long enough about all the stuff i read in may <laughs> Let me know down below what your favorite read was this month or if you're in the middle of a really good book. Um, I'd love to hear about it and I'll see you guys in my next video which should be my TBR for next month. It's gonna be it's gonna be intimidating.